This is Bill King, and it's Conversations in All Keys from the Red Red Theater. And our special guest today is Sandra Boza, and she's the 2018 Toronto Blues Talent Search winner. Mm -hmm. Also, you have a new album out. This is, is this second or third one? Second. Second, and second it's called The Sound in the Dark. Yeah. Welcome in. Thank you. It's good to have you here. It's great and to be And you back. were here recently. You did your CD release. Yes. And you had one of the largest crowds we've ever had. That's so, that's so cool. <laughs> Somebody told you before. <laughs> I think you. <laughs> I, I did that. Huh? You yeah. know something? It was a chance. You, you know, in situations like this, after you've recorded the album, you set with the album, you plan your marketing, and there's so much time in between that and then getting a record release. And then you get on stage. And then that's it. So the stage thing is like so short. Yeah. It's like, it goes like this. And then you go, what happened? Because all the prep beforehand went on for months. Yeah. How did, how did you find yourself in that? That is, it's, it's so true. Because I, I think about that a lot. I get, you know, you have the anxiety, especially with shows like this. Because I came early and I set it up. I, you know, I decorated a little bit. And, you know, you're doing promotion and you're booking, you're rehearsing. So it's true. A lot goes into it. And, and you know the day of, you're like, it's going to be... It's gonna be over like that, you know, and it's it's and it's gonna be great, you know. It because I I get sometimes I get pre-show. Well, often I get pre-show anxiety, like a lot of performers. But, you know, I have a great group, and the crowd I knew was gonna be great, and the staff here is great, and so you know it's gonna be. There's gonna be a few mistakes here and there because that's normal, mm -hmm. but like ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, you know it's gonna fly by. Yeah. But it's it was still so like I thought I I was starting to get concerned that you could actually damage. Muscles in your cheek from smiling. Because <laughs> that night I was just, I was always over the moon. It was such a cool night. And you, you know, something I was, when I was watching it that night, at night I was thinking, um, it takes a, a little while to relax. But once you relax and you get, you fall into this yeah. whole thing, it's, it's like a safety zone. And then you can just be you and sing like you want to. And then you like to pace things. You don't want to rush anything. Yeah you can communicate with the audience. And it seemed like you found your spot. Yeah, I, I did. And sometimes if I'm really finding it hard to settle, um, I like starting with, sometimes I'll, I'll tell the band I'm going to actually start solo. And I'll start with an acoustic song, usually 4 and 20 by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, because that's the song that sort of settles me a bit. So, um, so, but I didn't need to do that here. I was just, I was really feeling good about everything. And I went on, it was such a good crowd, and it was... Yeah, I, I felt pretty at home pretty quickly. And like uh, live is my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I'm actually more comfortable live than I am in the studio because I've done so many live shows in my life. Like I worked overseas, you know, six, seven nights a week. I played all the little bars in Toronto before I actually started like investing in myself mm -hmm. and recording. So for me, live is like where I'm comfortable. Speaking of overseas, you spent half your childhood overseas. Yeah. In yeah, Spain. Yeah. Yes. With your dad. Yeah. Well, with my mom, actually. My dad was here working, so we could... Okay. Yeah, but with my dad's family, yeah. That's all right. And, yeah. and how'd that work out for you? Oh, pretty great. You know, <laughs> up in the mountains. Um, I always think my mom, it was a big sacrifice for my mom because she was, you know, she's from Scarborough. She grew up, she's Irish-Canadian, grew up in Scarborough. And then, you know, she marries my dad, who's Spanish. And she, she was a teacher, so she could take our schoolwork and just, like, you know just taking this woman from Scarborough and plopping her into the mountains of Spain. Like, I mean, rural. Like, homeschool. Yeah, and she would homeschool us for four or five months every other year. So, it was, you know, was, and we had, like, my sister and I had each other, and we would run around the mountain and, you know, explore. But my mom was, like, just there. And, like, my family, you know, my, my um, grandparents and my aunt, um, they loved her. And I think that they knew what she was doing for us so that we could know our family. So yeah. that meant a lot to them. So they, they loved her. It's, and it's also the origins of in many ways, songwriting and yeah. that region of the world uh, points to Spain yeah. in many ways uh, yeah. when you start looking at the history of songs and how songs, storytelling and how songs come together in yeah. Africa and other places. But yeah. there's something about <clears throat> Andalusia yeah. and places like this where when you go back to history books and you keep tracing back, you go, wow, this is like where there are first scripted songs and yeah, well, I mean, it's 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 a Celtic region, right? Galicia, yeah. like, you know, we have bagpipes, and like people think of Spain, they think of like flamenco, and which is I love flamenco, but that part of Spain, it's Celtic, and there's such an interesting storytelling history there, and yeah. like a lot of the Gallego, like we do a Gallego song in this album, and it's one of my favorite artists, Carlos Núñez, did this song called um, La Bandera de Noite, and so we do a, a a version of it. 
and it's just it's it's a really the way that you know the the wording it's so lyrical in the storytelling in that tradition and the sound of the the music is lyrical like it's mm -hmm. just everything is it's it's really narrative you know and it's just i think that i sort of subconsciously pull from that style in my music now were you listening to spanish singers when you were young i did yeah more more North American, probably, because we were influenced by my mom, mostly, because right, right, okay. um, my dad worked a lot. So my mom was always, we always had 1050 Chum on the radio, and she would drill us, like, if a song came on the radio, she'd be like, who is this? The Beatles, what album? <laughs> like, <laughs> so we, like, I didn't even know there was modern music until I went to school. I think it was, like, grade one. I'd never heard of the hey, kids where did, on where the block. Where did you go to school? St. Jude's at, like, Finch and Weston. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, after that, you went... After that, we moved to Markham when I was in high school. Okay. Um, and then I went to school in Hamilton, and then I moved to Scotland to do my master's. And Your master's in what? <laughs> museum studies. Very different. Okay. Very, very different. <laughs> okay. And yeah. was, this was something that was a, of an interest to you? Yeah. As oh, you yeah. Were okay. Yeah, I, still, I, I think I always loved the parallels in storytelling and history. That's why I loved history, because yeah. it was just stories. Like, what, what could be better? Because it was sort of... It was a little bit drummed into us that you couldn't do music as a career when we were kids. You know, it was sort mm. of my, my, my parents wanted stability for us. So it was like, you can't do music. My sister and I now are both in music. So, but we both kind of looked at different things to go into. So history was a huge passion of mine. It still is. I'm still a huge history nerd. But I love the storytelling in history. And, that, that, you know, it was just to me, it was like, if I worked in museums, it's just like a career of stories. You know, and somebody telling else's. somebody else's stories, yeah. our story, yeah. you know, I mean, and I see the parallels in music of that. Like, what I love about music is that somebody could write a song, like, 20, 30, 50 years ago about an emotion that they're having, and then you could listen to that song today and completely identify yeah. with the wording, you know, and that this person feels like this, and I feel exactly like this. It's like yeah. a photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of a moment. It's capturing a certain moment yeah. in time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a different way of expressing themselves. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, songwriting, this is something that you must have just said. Uh, were, there, were there songwriters when you were uh, when you were young? Were there songs that you said, I'd like to take this apart because I want to, you know, there's something about this that, yeah. that uh, boy, it's, it plays to me. Neil Young. Neil Young. Yeah, I'm a huge Neil Young fan. I've okay. seen him seven times. And um, there's like certain spiritual moments you have with certain mm -hmm. songs, you know. And my first musical spiritual moment was Neil Young listening to Old Man. I remember my mom had this old cassette tape and it had like a bunch of different like random, random songs like Neil Young and uh, Total Eclipse of the Heart and just completely random combinations. But I remember I heard Old Man and I remember thinking like, like what is this? It's just such atmosphere, right? And I wanted to take that apart because I, when I started writing songs, um, I think I was really trying, trying to challenge the whole chick with a guitar thing, which is, you know, just ego, because mm -hmm. there's some amazing women that write songs, and his, Joni Mitchell, you know I mean? But it was yeah. just ego. I wanted to just, I hated that trope, you know? Um, and because every time I picked up a guitar and wanted to sing, somebody would say, are you going to do a jewel song? And I just, another super talented artist, but it was just ego, right? It was total ego. So I always tried to write more complicated, like over complicated, you know? So you'd lose the whole... A lot of words. Yeah, a lot of words, yeah. a lot of... Um, time signatures, a lot of everything, just so you're missing. And then I remember hearing this Neil Young song, and it was so simple, but it had such atmosphere. And like to achieve that simplicity with so, with with so to achieve that atmosphere with such simplicity was just powerful. So I wanted to dig that apart. And it's fun to play with words and, and sentences. Uh, a lot of the great writers, like Hemingway, mm -hmm. would toil over a sentence yeah. for days. Yeah and rearrange words in it and stuff like that. With singers, especially singer-songwriter, it's also finding um, the note, how the note wraps itself around, or how the word wraps itself around a, a tone yeah. or a note. Yeah. And that is a whole different thing. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you must, you go, okay, this word is just ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> I do play around with, with words. Words really mean a lot to me. Like, I yeah. think... I remember, do you, you know Harry Manx? Yeah. I love Harry Manx. Mm -hmm. And I heard him speak at this thing, um, at, a, at the Blue Summit a few years ago. And I remember him saying, I don't, I never waste a word. There's no throwaway words. Right. And I love that because I've always felt that way. Mm -hmm. um, like you, I saw, so like if there's a word I don't like, it's still, it's, it bothers me. And like, I don't like to just put it in because it fits or 
or it rhymes or it you know fits like um, phonetically like I, I it has to mean something it has to say something you know it has to flow yeah yeah you know we were talking about words and everything um, I find that you know I would get people send tapes to me or recordings and stuff and and this is my new record and this is my thing and I get like 30 seconds in and I, I hate the lyric because of exactly that because yeah. I think there's too much throwaway in the yeah. song yeah oh yeah and then I figured time. to me the song is a throwaway it does well it kind of it kind of <laughs> for me like I, I this, it kind of kills everything because then yeah. I spend the next like 30 seconds or 60 seconds going like what does that mean but but what but why <laughs> you know it does it kind of and there's other times where it's the direct opposite, where you hear a line and you're like, oh my God, what a line, what a yeah. lyric. Like, I love that. And, you know, I've had, like, I'm not at all comparing myself to the greatest songwriters in history, but, like, I, you know, if somebody comments on, like, man, what a lyric that was, that is, like, the hugest it's, compliment. Yeah. Or if somebody, somebody says to me once, every time I listen, I hear a different lyric that hits me, and that, things like that are huge compliments. And you, you also think about, you know, it comes to mind, you go, whoa, the person who wrote this that they must think the same thing, or I wonder if they recognize that. Because what yeah. they've just got is a, something that's it's sealed. And yeah. It's the deal. Yeah. You know, I, I love that. Um, singing, beyond songwriting, uh, you had a great voice. Thank you. And, and, uh, it, and it, has, it has appeal. You know, this is, this is another thing. There's so many voices. There's so many people making recordings. It's not, not all, you know, they... They work for what they work at, but to to bridge that gap where the words and the voice and the whole thing comes together, um, well, you must have, you know, there must have been people in mind or something that made you want to sing and you, you just heard something. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, like, again, my mom, we had a great musical education with my mom. Yeah. But we were, she also sings, right? So right. she was always singing to us. So we always had music in the house. She would also, like, she really went out of her way to make sure that we had, like, culture. So she would, you know, we grew up at, like, Finch and West. You know, my dad worked really, really hard. But when we were kids, we didn't have a ton. Yeah. And my mom, would, like, we started learning piano on a piece of paper, like, drawn out on the keyboard. And my mom would make sure that she took us to things. Like, she, she would take us to see musicals, like, crazy for you. So, like, we learned about Gershwin really young, Phantom of the Opera. Like, my sister and I would sit on the rooftop of our garage and sang the entire musicals. Like the entire, I mean, the spoken word, the dialogue, everything, like from start to finish. I mean, this is what we were doing for fun, right? Um, so singing was just always there. My sister sang, she's an opera singer. Well, you heard her at the, she's mm -hmm. amazing. You should hear her oh, do yeah. like her thing when she does like opera, woo, it's amazing. Like the clarity and the purity in her voice. Yeah. Um, sorry, sidetracked. But so yeah, it was just singing, there was, it was just always there. And then we had singers that we liked, you know, that, that we'd listen to. Like Joni Mitchell, my mom always listened to Joni Mitchell. Um, but as far as like hearing singers then that I wanted to sort of emulate, I'd say the first time I heard a singer that I wanted to sing like was Ella Fitzgerald. Because mm -hmm. my mom wasn't really, she didn't really listen to a lot of jazz. But when I discovered jazz, I remember Ella Fitzgerald was just like, I just couldn't get enough. And I wanted to sing everything like it was Ella Fitzgerald. And I remember once we were trying to sing something for some family function and I was having trouble like getting getting the, the phrase or something, and my sister was trying to give me tips. And she said, okay, try this. Sing it like it's jazz. And I sang it, and I got it like that. And she said, it's because you're comfortable. Because I, was, yeah. I, I sang, just sang along to Ella Fitzgerald, like, constantly. So my voice was comfortable in that place, right? Like, you hear so many like, pop singers, like Amy Winehouse, you know, mm -hmm. she had such that jazz tone, that little vibrato that she just, that trails at the it's, end. But she, she also had a dad that... Had quite the collection. Yeah, yeah, and he, I think he raised her on a lot of jazz too. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it seemed like when she went out, well, when you first heard her, and she was on the early uh, TV shows, she was on with Jules Holland. Yeah. On yeah. Uh, BBC. Yeah. And she'd be singing, you know, rhythm yeah. and blues. Yeah. About it, that, and then she'd sing a jazz standard and stuff. Yeah. So she had pretty good grounding in that, and she sort of, you know, and, and it sort of played well for her when they made the change over to pop into the small yeah. group and yeah. and that whole sound. Yeah. So how do you find yourself in blues? <laughs> it's, I, I ask myself all the time. Um, I, I don't know. I just always, like, I liked blues. I've always loved listening to blues, but I never called myself a blues singer. Oh. And I, I, I never wanted to um, because I, I, I didn't, I wanted to be very careful about 
associating myself with blues music because it came from a very specific place. Mm -hmm. And so I never called myself a blues singer, but I kept getting called a blues singer. Even like my very first album that I don't talk about very much, I recorded it in Vancouver, an EP. And it's not at all, there's nothing blues about it. There's nothing, you know, it's like almost Canadiana. And somebody was like, wow, what a great blues singer. I'm like, what? <laughs> and then um, actually that you mentioned the 2018 um, blues, the, the blues yeah. thing, yeah. So that, do you know Ta Don Tyler Watson? Oh, really? Well. So she's, yeah, yeah, she's a very good friend of mine. I've yeah. known her for years. And I remember she kept saying, enter the blues competition, enter the blues competition. And I kept saying, I'm not a blues singer, Don. I'm not a blues singer. I'm not a blues singer. I'm not a blues singer. And finally, in 2018, I entered that thing to shut her up so that she would leave me alone. Yeah. And so I, you know, paid my $10 and I entered the competition and then I won it. And then she, now she'll never shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you had to go out and record every Muddy Waters song. <laughs> I mean, and that, like, I love, I, I mean, yeah. the first time I heard um, Howling Wolf, it was like another spiritual yeah. moment. That was, That's I talk right. about that all the time. Like, when I heard Smokestack Lightning, it was like, like what is this music? Yeah. This is amazing. So I love the blues. And I mean, all pop music comes from that place, right? Mm -hmm. But again, I just, I felt that I needed to be very careful about identifying as a blues singer. Because, I, I, you know, I think appropriation and appreciation can it can the lines can blur very easily and so i yeah. wanted to be very careful about acknowledging where it came from you know and find yourself in it you know uh speaking of that talent search i guess the the award was uh one of the things was me and you take that walk in kensington oh Market yeah oh i forgot about that for the photo <laughs> that was so much fun <laughs> i totally forgot about that and, and i thought this is pretty cool because you know, going down Baldwin Street and going down the streets, there was there were scarves and clothes. Yeah, there yeah. was things you could do, and the the people cooperated so great because we just walk into a stall <laughs> and just say, "Well, let's try some photos here," and they go, "Yeah, go ahead." And yeah. then, of course, they tried to get in the photo too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was, it was a great introduction. It was yeah. it was just and those photos still look great. I mean, when I look, yeah. I, I, I come across them here and here and there, I go, "Boy, these just for a casual walk around, they look yeah. great." Yeah, it was and then I lost cool. track of you. Well, so what happened? This pandemic happened. I mean, I that's guess. a pandemic, right? That's right. Yeah, because I released an album right before the pandemic, like 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 February, I think fifteenth, twenty twenty was my album release, and then okay, oh, a few just, weeks later everything shut down. Oh yeah, great <laughs> business plan, right? <laughs> but you wouldn't know. <laughs> oh, I scored. What do you no, mean? but nobody would have known that February that things were going to shut down yeah. for the next two years. Yeah, or so. no, yeah, it was. You know, you know, it is what it is. But, but you yeah. said you played a lot of gigs and stuff. What kind of gigs were you playing? Um, well, you know, like overseas, I was in Morocco for a while, um, and then Senegal for a bit. Now, so what, I was playing, what kind of gigs would you do there? Those were like hotel gigs. Oh, just like all, sometimes yeah, yeah. it was in, um, yeah. sometimes it was like nightclubs and we were doing like show band stuff. Um, I didn't dig that as much. What I really dug was when I started doing the lounge stuff just as a duo. Yeah. And I had one of my favorite guitar players, one of my favorite coworkers was this guy, um, Kevin Cummings from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Do you know the song Funking for Jamaica by Tom Brown? Yeah, of yeah, course. he played on that like really? way back when. Wow! Like this guy, you, oh, you'd love him. He's awesome. But he, his first professional gig was opening for Parliament Funkadelic. He Can't toured like with that. the Commodores, like super cool dude. And I remember we met, and we played like that night. We met at the sound check, and then we played that night, and it was like that. Like we, I think we rehearsed in two years. We rehearsed like one time, because <laughs> we just knew all the same stuff. But we wrote stuff on, mm -hmm. on the spot. Right. And so it was just, it was just so freeing playing with him. Because he knew where I was going to go. Um, I knew where he was going to go. We, we did all the same covers. He sings. He plays piano. Like, and we just kind of were musical brain twins a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, We made some really cool stuff. But so those gigs were my favorite. Just, and I still have a really great duo partner in Toronto, too, Mike Friedman. He's a jazz guy. And you do that still here? Same thing, yeah. yeah. Um, so just kind of you know, like cocktail parties and receptions. And just but to, this is, this is the, con the conversation I had with Diana Krall in 1998. And this is just when things are starting to move for her. Yeah. And she was talking about, I think it was, she would, uh, she would uh, take the train to Philadelphia every, every, I guess, three nights a week and play in a hotel lounge. And she would sit at the piano. Yeah. And nobody bothered her. Yeah. And she just sang the <laughs> Those songs. Those are the best gigs, yeah. And she goes, nobody paid attention. I just played and I learned all these songs. Yeah. And then I worked out these harmonies. She goes, so I looked at that. Every time I went in, I, I said, I'm not going to kill any time here. I'm just going to look at this as rehearsal. And yeah, I paid it, rehearsal, it, that's but. exactly what it was. It yeah. was great. I mean, and we wrote, we wrote songs like on the spot there. Like some of the songs on my last album were written like as jams when the bar was empty. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would just jam and like, this, this is 
It's great. It's cool too. Now, what's this Halls Island retreat you did? Or Halls artists? Island? Um, it was artists in residence. Artists, or? yeah, it was a residency. Where's Halls Island? At? It's just off of where is it? Halliburton. It's in okay. Halliburton on Koshlong Lake. Really cool. And what were you doing? I was just writing music for ten days, just like on this island by myself. It was so cool. What were you doing most of the time? Writing tunes and looking out and going, oh, swimming, goodness. swimming. <laughs> wow, there's a black bear. I love swimming. Oh yeah. yeah. No, it was an island. There was nothing, no, on, the nothing island. on the island. Nothing. Just... Oh, that had to be good. Yeah, that's actually "Sound in the Dark" was written because of that. Because I was on this island by right. myself, and I went down one night to go swimming, and I heard a noise. Have you heard this story? No. So I tell this story every time I play this song, except for at the album release, which is funny. Okay. So a "Sound in the Dark," I I went and decided I was going to go skinny dipping because this is like an island. There's nobody there, right? Perfect. So I go down and like it's beautiful clear sky and I was going to just go for a, a swim and then I get in the water and it was perfect and then I was in the water for like two seconds and I heard a sound and I got freaked out and I ran back up to the cabin and then I was so angry at myself because it was this beautiful night and it was probably nothing. It was probably a fish jumping. Like there were no black yeah. bears on this yeah. island. So I was so <laughs> mad at myself. So I wrote that song like that night out of, you know. Anger, because well, I started thinking about all the other times that like fear has stopped me. Yeah. You know, like I'm 40 years old, yeah. and I've only just started really investing in my career. And I think a lot of that is like fear of failure, fear of success, the same thing. Yeah. And so I started thinking about fear stopping me from so many things in my life. And so, yeah, I mean, I know it was just a skinny debate experience, but it started, you know, I started spiraling but, into all the other things. But you know, something you have to come to terms with that because I think it's something that. Most people feel like they have to follow a certain path, mm -hmm. and they're not going to step out and, and uh, take a chance and believe in themselves enough. Yeah. But once you get to that, I, I think what it is, you take 40 and you double 40, you make 80. And then a person at 80 will go, oh, my God, what was I doing? I should have just jumped in. Yeah. And so you sort of have to have that mindset saying that at 80, that person's going to think, Oh, I missed out. Why, what was going on? Yeah. I had nothing to fear. Yeah. You know, because you really don't pay any attention to the, the stuff around you that may push push against that. Yeah. You just do it. Yeah. You know, is this something that's, are you feel motivated now just to say, I'm going to do this and not be distracted or? Usually, yeah, for the most part. For I the mean, most it's, part? You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's hard sometimes to not get, you know, a little demoralized or, or stuck in that fear again. You know, I mean, I'm human. We're yeah. all human. But... Definitely more so than, than I used yeah. to. Now, you still playing a lot or still doing? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to play not because I used to, for years, I played like every little dingy bar in Toronto for no money and like just toiled and toiled and You'd toiled. Like to get paid and, now. I'd like to get paid now. Yeah, I, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I'd also like that, like this show here was amazing. Yeah. Like in playing sort of fewer shows but bigger. Then yeah. you kind of create a little more anticipation. Because when I used to play like three times a week, I'm like, oh, well, we'll catch her next week. We'll catch her next week, you know? Yeah. So now it's kind of like if you can make it more of an event yeah. and kind of get, I mean, you know, this was amazing. But, you know, I mean, to have this every few months would be awesome. Like this kind of. Now, this summer, know. did you tour some across Canada or anything? No, I didn't. I'm hoping to Are you next trying to year. do this? Are you doing the applications? And yeah, yeah, I've got a booking agent thing. now. So I did a showcase in Alberta last a few months ago. Okay. So hopefully we'll have more like across Canada. I'm trying to, my manager, he's great. I love him. Ken Sims, he's always trying to get me to like just be patient and like yeah. it'll happen because I'm always like trying to jump. I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's, he's kind of trying to help me see the growth instead of me looking, seeing everything that's not happening yet, he's trying to get me to see like where I was and what I have now and like that it's, it's you know, it's happening. And, yeah. But I try not to have expectations, but also try to be positive. You know what I mean? There's like uh -huh. this kind of crossover of, you know. I love to read biographies and I always read stuff, on, I read things background on great artists and stuff and, and all of them say the same thing. Uh, a door opens, you step through. You know, because you don't know what's on the other side. Yeah. But it's the fact that you step through is the first step. Yeah. And once you step through, things happen. Yeah. So yeah. So that's, that's what you have to do. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't through. matter. And I had Lou Pomonte earlier, and we were talking about um, mixing, just mixing. Yeah. And when we were younger, <laughs> it, we sat on the side of the console while the engineer mixed. We yeah. never could do that. We didn't yeah. touch a yeah. uh, pot or, uh, or anything. And now we inhabit that seat too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the thing is, 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 is courage and you just, you know, well, I'm just going to do it. Just do it, yeah. And, and because yeah. what's, what's, nothing's going to happen. 
I mean, otherwise, I mean, it's, you know, the blowback is not going to be what you think it's going yeah. to be. Yeah, well, I mean, something will happen, you know, and, and so good, not nothing will happen. No, I but that's what thing. I mean. Things, yeah, exactly. Something yeah. will happen. Yeah. Uh, it may not be everything you want, but yeah. and then the, something else will happen. Well, I'm really trying to get more into that headspace of like, yeah, like that something will happen. It might not be what you want, but it will be something that you can learn from either yeah. way. You know, I mean, and because it, it's it's hard not sometimes to think like, okay, I want this, and I'm going to do it this way, and then this is going to happen. And then you know, the universe kind of says, well, no, over here is this amazing thing, and you're like, no, universe, shh, I'm looking over here, and the universe <laughs> is like, look at me over here, I've got this amazing thing, and you're like, I'm looking at this, and you know, and then you miss out on all these great opportunities or experiences or lessons yeah. because you're so fixated on like trying to control this one thing, you know, and yeah. you've got a whole, you know. World I'm, of possibilities. It's three. It's three letters. Yes. Yeah. You just say yes. <laughs> it, 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 you know. Then you can say no. I overcomplicate things. Yeah, but you go. You go <laughs> yes. Uh, before we get done, uh, yeah. you, you we were talking about New Orleans at the beginning. Oh yeah. Now, did you go for a period of time or just? I went for two weeks. Two weeks. Just a total random summer decision. Thing? Uh, summer when did that go? Yeah. Um, I think it was in the spring. In the spring. Why well, is a good time? It was the French Quarter Fest. Okay. I went specifically not during Mardi Gras because I didn't want to go when there were crazy crowds. That's February. And then That's I got crazy. there and it was the French Quarter Fest and I was like, look crazy at crowds. all these crazy crowds. Yeah. yeah. But then I ended up making friends with a street artist, and so I would hang out in his booth if I needed like some. An anchor. Yeah, and uh, and then he started leaving and going to get coffee. We like watched my booth, so I would sell his stuff for him. <laughs> it was great. It was such a cool trip, man. Like what an amazing magical place. Yeah, it, it's got a history that. <clears throat> I, I was reading Jelly Roll Martin's book, and uh, I guess it was these were from the uh, Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, they did the tapes because he, they had interviewed him, and these are just all his stories, right? Yeah, yeah. And you think about Storyville, and you think about yeah, because basically it was one of those cities in America that had a, it was like like Wild Wild West. It was yeah. just like it, you know, it didn't matter what you were. That there was a place for you within the community. If yeah. you were gay, if you were insane, if you were a gambler, yeah. or yeah. you were this, yeah. a musician, or whatever, there was room for you. You know, I mean, there would be the locals who would always try to change the laws to fit the the, yeah. the Bible crowd. Yeah. But as far as the city, it was kind of open in America for so many things. Yeah, yeah. I, I think about that sometimes too. Like I, when I used to travel a lot, and I was, you know, I was working in Morocco, and I was, you know, going to Amsterdam or Paris on like a week off. I was doing all this stuff and it was exciting and now I'm in Toronto trying to like, you know, establish a career and a home base and like I'm not doing as much. I'm like and I'm kinda of craving these experiences to like push I get me that. to Yeah. I get impatient. <laughs> no, but I I, I, I I can see that. Because travel is is just pure magic. Yeah. Once you're there, everything that's behind you is gone. Yeah. And it's just you there in that moment. Yeah. Every moment. Yeah. And there's something special about that. Yeah. And can Meeting you travel? You like traveling alone? I love traveling. I, alone? Yeah, I love traveling alone, especially. Yeah. Because you always meet people. You yeah. know, I loved staying in hostels. And I would always, like in New Orleans, I stayed in this, I stayed one week in the Garden District and one week in the um, in the French Quarter. Mm -hmm. And I still have people I talk to there, you know, because you always get a little family in hostel. Yeah. People that you kind of stick with and you travel and you do things. And then you go somewhere else and you find new people. Or you do stuff alone. You know, when I went to Paris, I, I specifically didn't want it travel with anybody or like, you know, meet mm -hmm. anybody. I just kept to myself and I just wandered. Like, I love getting lost in cities. Best way to do it. It's the best way to like find yeah. cool areas, you know? I mean, Barcelona, like I just got lost and I walked like 30 kilometers in the day and I found all these cool neighborhoods and, you know, I mean, those are where like these great stories come from, you know? Oh, like yeah. when I was, I was talking to somebody earlier today about this, when I was in Rabat, Morocco, I, um, I decided not to bring my acoustic and I was going to try to buy one there. Because I, was, I wasn't really doing acoustic stuff on this gig. Um, but I wanted to buy one just to play on my own. So I found this little music store in Rabat. And like I bought this little guitar. And I ended up talking to the owner. And so I was doing that contract for a month and a half. You were in each city. Mm -hmm. And so I would go back and like have coffee with the, the store owner. He would invite me back and he would make me coffee. And he really didn't speak great English. And I didn't speak great French. So we would like communicate however best we could but I think he and just enjoy the interaction and I enjoy the interaction and like just having this like you know like, I, even like wherever I live I love going into a coffee shop and having people know who I am and know what I drink and like or you know I used to work at the old Nick do you remember the old Nick yeah, on the day yeah, forth yeah. I loved the regulars that would come in and I would see them at the door and by the time they were at their seat I had their their you know whatever they wanted 
And You're there. Yeah, like, I love that. I love that. And so, you know, this random place, you know, I go to Morocco and I end up, this, and I'd walk in the door and he'd be like, cafe. Like, yep. <laughs> and we'd sit there and we'd have a mishmash of conversation. And it, was, it was so cool, you know. I mean, so what's coming up now? What's coming up now? What's, what's, what, what, do you, what do you plan? What are the plans of that? Next week I'm going to Mexico. Oh, right. I have a gig in Mexico, which is super cool. Blues on the Beach, have you heard of it? No, but Another that, blues thing, yeah. that sounds like the gig to go to. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, Dawn actually put me in, in touch with All it. Right. She recommended me because they asked her and she couldn't do it. So she's like, the next best thing for her doing it is me doing it. <laughs> it's just, thank you, that's Dawn. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, next week I, I go and I meet the band. I gave them a song list. And, mm -hmm. yeah. And then after that, I'm playing at Sellers and Newell. January. I like Sellers. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a cool place. spot. You should come by. It's January oh. 26th. That sounds yeah. great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, did you get to the red room? Oh, she um, called me. Oh, well, she contacted, she contacted me else. early, like six months before. No, but it was through you. It was through her. Oh, um, yeah. Brett, you know Brett Jensen? He kind of books stuff for Carol Pope. I think. And oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, was, cause cause, he said that. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, I met Maria like years ago outside with her dog. Because I, do I love dogs. And so right, I started right. petting her dog. And we started chatting. And we just, you know, and then she said, you got to come by. And like, we're trying to start up. Oh, okay. And then the pandemic happened. So we didn't really, nothing ever happened. And we lost touch. And then Brent was like, ah, oh, I found this great venue you should do your release at. And then he said, the Redwood. And I'm like, I remember I was supposed to go see that place in the pandemic and everything. You know, we yeah. lost, lost communication. And yeah. Sandra Bowes. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate this. This Thank you. Great. This is great. Yeah, yeah. thank you. We it's got nice to know to you now. <laughs> <laughs> Since our walk in Kensington. <laughs> this, has been, uh, this has been uh, Conversations in All Keys at the Red Road Theater with Bill King and Sandra Bozen.